Who knows the thoughts of a boy? A boy fishing in the historic waters of the Mississippi. A river that was once the domain of Huck Finn. Bobbers in the river stay pretty much the same. And there's the same expectation for a big one on the hook below. But what about the boy? Does he see himself as another Huck Finn? Does he dream of steamboats and sternwheelers? Or of river pirates just around the bend? He might. Who knows? But one thing is certain. He is aware of the changing world around him. Steamboats and sternwheelers, symbols of travel and adventure, have been replaced by modern jet planes streaking across the sky. And a stone's throw from his own backyard is a nuclear power plant. Though he's only a boy, it's safe to say that his future is somehow related to jets and atoms. How is it that this nuclear power plant is now a part of the rural horizon just beyond the small community of Elk River, Minnesota? A horizon which once boasted only barns, silos, and corn cribs. Let's go back a bit. In June of 1958, a contract was signed between the Elk River Rural Cooperative Power Association and the United States Atomic Energy Commission for the construction of a nuclear reactor. A reactor plant that would add power potential to the existing RCPA generating plant, a plant that was already producing 45,000 kilowatts of electricity to serve the expanding power needs of the rural community of Elk River. Thus, the reactor site at Elk River was chosen, a small farm community approximately 30 miles northwest of Minneapolis and St. Paul, and 800 feet from the Mississippi River, with the reactor itself rising from a 40-foot sand knoll symbolic of the power plants of the future, housing energies many times greater than those available from coal, oil, or gas. The Elk River Reactor Plant is part of the Power Demonstration Reactor Program of the United States Atomic Energy Commission, a program for establishing the economical and technological feasibility of producing electrical power from nuclear energy, a program which will provide for the future power requirements of the Rural Cooperative Power Association. Building a reactor takes many months of planning and the efforts of many people, all benefiting from previous experience gained from the Atomic Energy Commission's program at plants in many parts of the country. All the materials must be specifically treated and inspected to meet AEC standards. Here the thermal shield which surrounds the reactor vessel is heated prior to the pouring of the lead shielding. This heating is done so that no air pockets will form as the molten lead is poured in. The lead shielding forms a barrier to the gamma rays emitted by the nuclear reaction. When the pouring is complete and the lead is cooled, the effectiveness of the shielding is tested by placing a radioactive source on the inside of the thermal shield and a measuring device on the exterior. As these are moved over the surface, the resulting densities are measured and recorded. The component parts are fabricated by subcontractors throughout the United States, and when they have been completed and tested, they are brought to the reactor site for final assembly. On the west coast, the reactor vessel starts its trip to Elk River by rail. The thermal shield arrives from the east. Assembly of the various components begins. As the reactor nears completion, the control rods are lowered into place while at the bottom of the reactor, the drive assemblies which raise and lower the control rods are put into place.
One of the final steps is the arrival of the fuel elements from their manufacturer. At this stage, the elements may be safely handled without special protection. When the reactor is finally housed under the large domed containment vessel, there's little evidence on the exterior of the energetic nuclear workshop within. The containment vessel itself is a steel structure 115 feet high and 78 feet in diameter, lined with a layer of concrete two feet thick. Completely enclosed, the containment vessel extends over 18 feet into the ground and, as its name implies, is constructed to contain anything that occurs within the walls of the vessel. The heart of the nuclear power plant is the reactor vessel and core. This is where the controlled fission of nuclear reaction takes place. The tremendous energy of fission is released in the form of heat. This is in reality no different from the heat generated in more conventional ways. As this heat boils the water, the water is transformed into steam, and thus this type of nuclear reactor is known as a boiling water reactor. Steam at 950 pounds per square inch pressure and 530 degrees Fahrenheit leaves the reactor vessel and enters a steam generator or heat exchanger. This is primary steam. Secondary water entering the bottom of the steam generator is heated by the primary steam and is also transformed into steam. Steam at a temperature of 506 degrees Fahrenheit and at a pressure of 715 pounds per square inch. This is secondary steam. The primary steam becomes water again as it loses heat to produce the secondary steam, and the water is returned to the reactor vessel for reheating into steam again. The secondary steam produced at the steam generator goes to a coal-fired superheater. Here it rises to 825 degrees Fahrenheit at 600 pounds pressure. It then flows to the steam turbine, turning it at a high rate of speed, driving the electrical generator to produce electricity. Thus, the continuous production of heat at the reactor core by nuclear fission results in primary steam to produce secondary steam, which drives the steam turbine to produce electrical energy at the generator. In this manner, the reactor with a conventional superheater produces up to 22,000 kilowatts of electrical power on a continuous year-round basis. Only the primary steam is exposed to the radiation of the nuclear reaction. The secondary steam, which drives the turbine, does not come in physical contact with the primary steam at any time. In one sense, this indirect cycle of the reactor plant system is like the hot air system for heating a home. The heat and gases from the fuel do not physically mix with the air that is heated for discharge through the registers. This room air is heated indirectly by the hot gases in the furnace, and these hot gases then go up the chimney. And as a house has a thermostat to control the heating, so must a nuclear power plant have a control for the amount of heat generated. A nuclear reactor is a device in which the fission chain reaction of atomic fuel is self-sustained. Control of this reaction is made possible by positioning control rods of borated stainless steel relative to the core of the reactor. Boron has the property of absorbing neutrons. Therefore, as the control rods are moved into the core, the reaction is slowed down, and conversely, as the control rods are moved out of the core, the reaction is intensified. In the Elk River reactor, there are 13 of these control rods, each automatically moved by individual control rod drives. These control rods are positioned to maintain a constant pressure of the steam at the inlet to the turbine. For example, if the turbine steam pressure drops, more steam is required. This means more heat must be generated in the reactor. This is done by withdrawing a control rod slightly to increase the reaction within the core to produce more heat. The reactor core is the heart of the nuclear power plant. The control room is the brain and the nervous system. A multitude of gauges and recording instruments continuously sense the operation of the reactor and initiate any corrective action that is necessary. Skilled and specially trained operators observe the operation of the plant as revealed in the control room and are alert to any variation in the operation that is not immediately corrected by the automatic control system. If, for example, the shield cooling should become too low, the operator is warned and can take corrective action far in advance of any potentially dangerous situation. And in an ultimate situation of danger, 
the operator can cause all the rods to scram or drop immediately into the core, thus completely stopping the nuclear reaction. This gravity-operated mechanical action of the control rods can be backed up with a flood of boric acid, which positively snuffs out the nuclear reaction. In normal operation, with a plant producing up to 22,000 kilowatts of electricity, the reactor will be shut down only for fuel reloading or repositioning of fuel elements. Fuel handling during the removal of spent fuel elements is carried out completely underwater. The fuel elements are brought from the reaction cavity to the storage well through a 15-foot canal. There is always 8 feet of water over the fuel elements as they're moved from the cavity to the well. Racks are provided around the face of the storage well for storing 148 elements from a full core, as well as room for an additional 20 spare elements for a total of 168 elements. Underwater lighting aids the operators during the fuel element transfer operation. The 148 fuel elements are arranged in the core in a complex grid pattern. Spaced portions between the various elements allow for the movement of the 13 control rods. Each fuel element consists of 25 stainless steel pins, each 5 feet long. Each fuel pin contains the nuclear fuel pellets of thoria urania, 120 pellets to the pin. Thus, for 148 fuel elements, there are 440,000 thoria urania fuel pellets. The individual fuel pellets are uranium enriched and are 4 tenths of an inch in diameter and a half inch in length. The amount of U-235 in the reactor totals 175 kilograms, which, if it were all consumed, would be equivalent to 540,000 tons of coal. When operating personnel enter the containment vessel for routine inspections, they enter through an airlock. This airlock prevents any leakage of the containment vessel air during entrance and exit from the vessel. There is an 8 by 10 foot door for freight and a two and one half foot emergency door also with its own airlock. An air conditioning system will pass 3,000 cubic feet of filtered air per minute continuously through the containment vessel. The filtered air is discharged through an exhaust duct located in the dome of the containment vessel. An air monitor at the inlet of the exhaust duct gives an alarm and closes the intake and exhaust ducts if radioactivity is present in the containment vessel air, thus isolating the vessel from the outside air. The Elk River reactor is constructed so that only an extremely small amount of radioactive material will accumulate. This amount is stored in shielded containers for later disposal in batches at locations on land or at sea, as specified by the Atomic Energy Commission. Water will be discharged into the building drain system only when prior radiochemical analysis shows that the concentration of radioactivity is well within accepted AEC tolerances. Such water is kept in the retention tanks and recycled until measurements show it is safe for discharge. Thus, the Elk River nuclear reactor operates within a sealed container exposed only to its own environment with no direct unmonitored contact with the outside. At a signal from the control room, the heart of the reactor starts to beat, and the power of nuclear energy creates electricity, electricity traveling over high tension lines to the surrounding community. And as the Atomic Energy Commission's program continues, the shape of the nuclear reactor plant will become a familiar landmark on the American scene utilizing atomic energy for electrical power that was untapped less than a decade ago. The Mississippi River may be oblivious to the changing age, the age of atomic power, but the boy cannot ignore it. He'll be a part of it. <laughs>